Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, EBM Tools Network, uh, which is co-coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org. And uh, today also uh, we have co-moderating this webinar, Nick Weiner, who is with OpenChannels.org. Uh, and we're very pleased to have Daniel Polly and Dirk Zeller uh, with the See Around Us uh, project at UBC, University of British Columbia, uh, here with us today to talk, uh, and the title of their presentation is The View Past Peak Catches, Global Catch Trends in Marine Fisheries. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. You can ask questions by typing them into the question panel of the user interface, and if you do that, I'll relay the questions to Dirk and Daniel. Um, we'll save most questions for the question and answer period at the end of the webinar, uh, but if there's just quick clarifying questions, I can potentially ask that during the webinar. Um, there's also the option to raise your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in the user interface. You can raise your virtual hand, and then I'll unmute you, and you can ask the question directly. Um, to Dirk and Daniel. So uh, that's another option. Uh, so I will go ahead and turn it over to uh, Dirk and Daniel now. Thank you guys so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Dirk and this is Daniel Poli. <clears throat> I hope you can hear us. Uh, we, we will take turns. Uh, Daniel will start off with a general introduction. I will talk you through the methodology and some examples of uh, catch data that we assembled, and then Daniel will wrap it up uh, with a global summary. All right. <clears throat> um, um, if we talk about uh, fisheries, um, the most important thing is the catch. Uh, you, you, you fish to obtain a catch, and the catch determines a lot of other things that are important, uh, the value of the catch, uh, the income of the fishes, the supply of fish to the market, and so on. And, uh, but strangely enough, um, nature a while ago uh, asked, where do we need catches? Uh, and uh, I answered in a little essay, catches are important. And, and what they did is, uh, put this discussion in the context of do we need catches for stock assessment, for evaluating, for managing the fisheries. And uh, in this context, we need actually more than catches. Uh, we don't have that for most countries of the world. Uh, in Africa and Asia, we don't have more than a catch, uh, if at all. But uh, it, is, uh, it was a wrong idea to, to oppose catches as to present catches as opposed to uh, other uh, things that we can know about the fish because, because uh, uh, it is important to know, uh, for example, the size of fisheries because you, if you should study it at all, uh, little fisheries don't warrant uh, uh, that you study them. We, we should know the value of a fishery uh, for economic studies and for fisheries access agreement and so on. We also need to know the catch, uh, if only to know, uh, if only to know how strongly the 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 fish, the, the sorry, the the boats that uh, or the operation that generates this catch will uh, impact habitat. For example, um, uh, shrimp trawlers have a huge impact on on the habitat because they discard a, a huge part of their catch. They catch lots of fish that they discard. Also. Um, uh, certain illegal catches are connected, uh, certain <clears throat> fraudulent activity are connected with catches whose magnitude is also important. Uh, so, in, in fact, one could argue that we don't know much about a fishery if we don't know its catch, if we know uh, other things uh, about the biology of the fish that, that are being caught but do not know the catch. So, this is where accurate statistics are, come in. But now, in most countries, uh, uh, the, the people who study the fishery of that country will have access to better data than uh, those produced by the, uh, those distributed by uh, the Food and Agriculture uh, Organization of the United Nations, FAO in Rome, uh, to which uh, all countries of the world send data. 
but uh, the scientists have better access to better data. But as soon as you work uh, internationally, or, and you know you need uh, several countries, uh, you need the, to have the data from several countries, you are, you, you are stuck with FAO, because this is the only, the only data set uh, that is international. And the, the point is, and that cost us lots of energy to get there, and, and lots of, we had to overcome lots of our training, the FAO statistics are misleading. And they are misleading because uh, uh, they have a bias. We, we documented uh, first in 2001 uh, a, a huge bias upward uh, created by China. Uh, China uh, reported and still does uh, exaggerated catches, as do some countries in, in Asia. But actually, the, the major bias in the FO statistics is uh, <clears throat> the, underestimate, the underestimation of small-scale small scale fish, fisheries that are not covered, uh, recreational fisheries are not covered at all, subsistence fisheries and artisanal fisheries are not covered well. And the, the, the illegal catches are obviously not covered. And uh, in fact, uh, foreign catches are very often not covered. Uh, this is all under the, the the, the, the acronym IUU, uh, uh, but uh, these are not only illegal catches. This is uh, uh, the biggest category of, of, of IUU catches are actually unreported catches. Now, you could imagine that we, who are we to know more than FAO and all the countries that participate in, in, in this database? But we actually, actually can straightforwardly infer catches that are missing in that database because fishing is a social activity and as such it cannot operate in a given country without uh, having uh, what, uh, what we call a shadow on that country. Uh, imagine uh, people going out to fish. They will provide employment, they will use fuel, they will use spare parts and repair and stuff, they will generate fish that are sold to restaurants or to resorts nearby. And for all these reasons, the fishery cannot, cannot be unobserved. And if it is observed, then it generates data from which you can infer the catch. So it's not, it's not possible to have a fishery that is totally undocumented. The second point is that if you don't know something uh, that has a positive product, for example, fish catches. Uh, zero is not a good estimation of it. It's not a good estimate of it. And uh, absent uh, detailed statistics, the putting a zero as estimate or not available, which is then turned into a zero, is always wrong. Uh, and it's better to, to, to give even a, a rough estimation than, than a zero. So basically, catch reconstruction are built around that. Uh, you, 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 we have estimated, we, we, we start in 1950 because uh, it pro provides a good contrast to, to the present. This is uh, the immediate post-war period when fisheries were not uh, industrialized in many countries and uh, lots of countries were colonies and so on. So this is a, a good, a good a good start, and uh, in the catch reconstruction, you cover all sectors, uh, uh, industrial, artisanal, subsistence, recreational, and we, we also cover the catch that is uh, thrown overboard, that FAO doesn't, doesn't consider, that is the discounts. And basically, we use national data to complement uh, those that the countries submit to FAO. You want to take over? Okay. So I'll take over uh, uh, now. Um, as they already indicated, we, we uh, separate all catch data into uh, fishing sector, uh, which is something that, that the global database and many national databases do not do. Um, and we basically differentiate between large scale and small scale sectors. Um, the large scale we call industrial, the small scale can either be artisanal, 
which is small-scale commercial, or there can be subsistence, which is small-scale non-commercial, or recreational, which is for pleasure. Um, we, we do not use a global standardized definition, uh, despite the fact that we try to summarize it broadly here, but instead we use national or local definitions or a regional equivalent. Um, the reasons for that is it does not make sense to have a single global definition. Because think about this, any a boat that might be defined as an artisanal fishing vessel, let's say in Europe or in North America, that same vessel, the same size, the same engine capacity, if it would be transposed into somewhere in East Africa or in Asia, it might all of a sudden become a large-scale industrial vessel. So a, a single hard, hardly bound global definition does not make sense. And as we already indicated, when we talk about catch, we mean the landed catch plus the discarded catch. The uh, overall reconstruction is, is basically a, a seven-step process uh, which starts uh, with exam closely examining the official reported baseline data as countries report to FAO or in the cases of those countries that do not report to FAO because there are quite a few uh, for various reasons, FAO provide, uh, derives their best estimate of the official reported statistics. Um, we evaluate these data not only on their content, but also what they represent, i.e. how are they collected within the country, because that determines what may or may not be included. Uh, for example, if the official data are collected uh, not at landing sites or not on board the fishing vessel, but actually at the marketplace, at the main market or wholesale market, which is very common, particularly in the developing world, uh, then it's quite obvious that only commercial products that go through that market are actually captured by the statistical system. Um, so that allows us then to identify in step two what components must be missing from this official data. There may be certain fishing sectors like recreational subsistence, or they may be commercial catches that bypass the market system or sold directly to hotels, restaurants, or resorts, which is also very common in, ma in many tropical countries, uh, and so on. Once we identify these missing components, we then source alternative information data sources. We develop uh, what we call data anchor points for each of these components over time. We always do this conservatively. Um, we then do conservative interpolation between the anchor points to derive time series. And then we combine these uh, uh, unreported time series with the official reported time series to uh, derive a complete catch time series. And the final step, and the most recent one, step seven, is that we actually quantify the uncertainty um, of the time series of data. Uh, the way we do that is we, uh, we borrow a methodology from the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, where we assign scores um, of uh, reliability um, of how much we trust the data that was used to derive the unreported time series. Um, you know it here we go from very low, very low trust in data to very high. Note that uh, there's no medium score because that would be the easy way out. If you don't really know, then you just say medium. It's very uninformative. So you actually have to make a decision. <clears throat> now, we've done these reconstructions uh, by exclusive economic zones, so actually by the waters over which a country has uh, management responsibility and access uh, uh, control. Uh, there are, uh, based on our definition, about 273 EZ or EZ chunks. For example, the United States, we separate out into East Coast, Gulf of Mexico, West Coast, Alaska, and so on. So uh, each country may have multiple EZ components based on our definition. In cases where countries have not formally declared an exclusive economic zone, uh, using uh, uh, UNCLOS provisions, we have defined one for them for the purposes of these fisheries data assessment. In addition to these reconstructions for each EZ, we've also done a global reconstruction of the industrial tuna fisheries, which basically <coughs> operates worldwide. That was done slightly differently. Where are we now? Uh, we've done uh, well over 200 individual 
reconstruction projects for these 273 EZ pieces, as well as the global industrial pelagic that I mentioned. We've done this by year from 1950 to 2010, and at the moment we're in the process of updating the data to the most recent year, which is actually 2014. Uh, we've done this also by taxon, uh, and currently we have over 2,500 taxa, and by the end of it we'll be well over 3,000. All the data are also separated by fishing sector, as I alluded to earlier, and also by catch, what we call catch type, which means it's either landed catch or discarded catch, and whether it's reported or unreported. This is a visual representation of each of these EZs. The colored dots uh, imply that each of these has been documented in a technical report, as you see, in, which is red. Anything that is black, these technical reports have actually been taken to the primary literature, so are published in the peer-reviewed literature. And it's about close to half at this point, uh, and we are continuing to work to uh, put all of this into the uh, scientific literature. But all of these technical reports are freely available via our website. What we then do is we take these data and we allocate them to space. Uh, what we do is we subdivide the global ocean into half degree latitude by half degree longitude cells. So the global oceans uh, cover 180,000 cells. And we've derived a procedure by which we can take this catch data and assign them to these individual cells. So how do we do that? Uh, another little uh, diagram. Uh, basically, we combine three major components. On the top left, you see the catch data uh, that we alluded to so far, the reconstructed catch data, which is separated into three data layers purely for technical reasons. And I can answer the question later, but I don't want to go into details of these layers at the moment, but they comprise the reconstructed catch data. We combine that with two other uh, data sources. One are uh, uh, the fishing access information or fishing access agreements. Basically, we've built a database of fishing access which determines which fishing country has permission to fish in which other country's EZ waters. Um, it not only includes the agreements, such EU fishing agreements in West Africa, but also observed access. Um, the reason why there's observed access in there is because we cannot necessarily know about all official fishing agreements, because some of them are negotiated in secret, particularly some Asian countries are not very forthcoming in publishing their agreements, uh, and therefore their vessels might be perfectly legally allowed to fish in a country we just don't know. <clears throat> the third data set are biological taxon distributions. And that alludes to these 2,500 uh, uh, taxa uh, that comprise the catch data. For each of these taxa, we derived a distribution, a probability distribution um, using uh, data from FishBase and Sea Life Base, the online encyclopedia of, of marine life, um, which allows us to determine for each of our 180,000 uh, uh, cells the probability of occurrence of that individual taxon. You then combine these three data sets as layers overlaid, and you derive the intersection in, in GIS world, and you come up with the assigned catch uh, to each of the 180,000 cells for each year, for each taxon, for each fishing country, etc. And that is basically the core data set, our cell data layer, from which we can then derive maps uh, of catches, graphs, and also make data downloads available. Um, we present all of that information on our website that was, uh, over the last two years, uh, completely redesigned and reprogrammed with the help of Vulcan Incorporated um, in Seattle, which allows us to present not only, as you see on the right, interactive graphs and data download uh, for various spatial combinations such as EZ or large marine ecosystems or high seas areas or even uh, global total, but on the left, you also see their interactive maps. You can actually map the catch by fishing country. So you can basically ask the question, where does Spain fish in the world in, the 19, in 1960 or in 2010? And you can generate these maps on the fly, and you can visualize that. You can also download these data, these uh, uh, mapped data. Uh, however, the data sets are too large to allow download via the internet. So you have to access them via an R code library that we make public on GitHub. 
Now, I would like to talk you through a few examples of these catch-up instructions so you actually get a feel um, for what we're talking about. The first example I want to present is the Bahamas. This is the official data that the Bahamas government reports to FAO each year. And by the scale on the y-axis, you can already guess what's going to happen. The reconstructed uh, catch, however, is over two and a half times as much as the reported. So the total is actually two and a half times the reported. Um, you may ask, why is there such a big discrepancy? And if you look at this by fishing sector, you will notice very quickly that the data that the uh, National Government of the Bahamas reports to FAO, which is shown here as a red line overlaid over the data graph, actually captures the commercial component being the large scale in the artisanal fisheries very, very well. So the Bahamas does actually a good job at capturing their commercial fisheries. However, they completely miss the recreational fishery. And given that the Bahamas is a major tourist destination, recreational, particular tourist-based recreational fishing is a huge deal and also results in very high catches. This work was led by Nicholas Smith, who is from the Bahamas and who presented all of this work uh, to the Bahamian government, who were very interested in this. Yes, they were shocked when they saw the magnitude of it, but on the other hand, they also said, we've known that recreational fishery is big, but we never realized it's this big, and they really value this sort of information. Uh, second example, uh, I want to take you into the Pacific. Basically, I want to present a summary for uh, 20, 25 island entities in the Pacific. Some of them are countries, like the Cook Islands or Tonga. Some of them are states, like uh, the state of Hawaii, uh, and others are territories. These 25 countries combined, if you plot up the uh, reconstructed data and you overlay the data, all of these countries jointly report to FAO, you again get about two and a half times higher catch. The one thing you notice again is that uh, the commercial being artisanal and industrial are very well captured. And this is a, a recurring uh, a symptom in these reconstructions. The commercial data are very well captured by the official statistics. However, much of the subsistence fisheries catch is not, is missed by the statistical system in these countries. Uh, you, you may now start wondering why is that? Um, and you need to basically take history into account. So there's a little history lesson. Where do the statistical systems come from? Why were they developed? Again, you got to go back to the period uh, immediately after World War II when FAO and so on started uh, uh, decided were built, were uh, initiated, when they decided to build global databases. At that point, the global perspective was about economic development. So anything that, that can be uh, uh, done by the market and put on the market and uh, drive the Western perception of economic growth was worthwhile monitoring. That's why commercial fisheries are well monitored, but anything that did not enter the market for sale uh, was kind of sidelined. These days, however, when we are more concerned about ecosystem consideration of fisheries and ecosystem impacts of our activities, uh, we strongly feel that all takes from the ocean should be considered uh, to provide appropriate baseline data. And that's why we also include discarding in our data. Now, let's move on to the next example uh, for the United States. Um, I've covered developing countries so far. Let's look at a, a highly developed country. I only want to pick three examples, Arctic Alaska, the East Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, and Hawaii. Uh, if you talk about the Arctic, I'm talking about the FAO statistical area 18, which basically includes the waters of the United States, Arctic Alaska, uh, Arctic Canada, and Siberia. These are the reconstructed data for each of these uh, uh, areas, and you see each one of them has fisheries catches. Now, if you, uh, this is uh, only the first set, this is for Arctic Alaska. However, you notice at the bottom, reported catches are zero. Now, this is actually the case for all three of these areas. There's only one exception. The former Soviet Union, for one or two years, I believe in the 60s, reported a very small catch on their Arctic waters, which was probably an exploratory industrial fishery. Other than that, both the United States Canada and Russia report zero catches for their Arctic waters 
to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, I'm not saying that the United States does not know there are fisheries catches in the Arctic Alaska, because the state of Hawaii does know it. They do oh, surveys every now and then. State of Alaska knows, yeah. yeah. Um, but these data are not included in the data set that the countries forward to the FAO. East Coast United States. Um, again, you'll be surprised. You look here, okay, most of the catches are by, taken by the U.S. fisheries. Um, it, prior to the declaration of the EZ in the, in the 1980s, I think initially it was called the fisheries exclusion zone, there was quite a bit of foreign fishing by Russia, Portugal, and so on. However, in latter years, it's mainly U.S. If you look at the black line, that's the reported catch. So you would kind of assume, wow, the United States is doing a poor job. Let's look at this data, however, by landings versus discards. And what you notice is that the vast majority of the component that is unreported is actually discards, which have declined dramatically from the early time periods, but they still make a substantial component. These are unreported, and I need to be very clear. Uh, the data requests that FAO makes to each country each year explicitly states, do not include discards. So the FAO database is exclusively a commercial is exclusively a landings database. It is not a catch database. Um, however, as you see here circled in red, there also seem to particular for more recent year a bit of a discrepancy with quite quite a substantial chunk of unreported landings. So you might wonder how can that happen? Well, not too long ago, uh, US federal authorities actually uh, arrested the so-called godfather um, who was operating in Massachusetts and apparently was quite proud of being Ill involved in all sorts of illegal and li illicit activities. So illegal fishing or domestic fisheries violations also occur in a country like the US where the monitoring system is actually, and the management system is actually uh, very good. The last example I want to present is Hawaii. And here you see the, the very strong effect of the declaration of the exclusive economic zone by the United States in the early mid 1980s. Most of the catch prior to that time period was actually taken by foreign fleets. There was uh, substantial fishing by Japan uh, and the former Soviet Union in these waters. What I want you to really focus on here, however, is the latter period after the 1980s, where you notice that the recreational fishery is also is substantial. Um, again, Hawaii is a tourist de destination, and there's also a lot of uh, domestic recreational fishing. And again, the recreational data are missing from the data that the United States reports to FAO. Despite the fact that the United States has a very good recreational survey system and has very good recreational data, but they're not included in the data set they forward to FAO. Again, in this particular case, however, FAO explicitly asks countries that they can include recreational data in the reports sent to FAO. But to our knowledge, at the moment, there's only one country in the world who does that regularly, and that's Finland. So these are just a few run-through of, uh, of as examples. So overall, we have about 273 of those. And now I'm going to hand it back to Daniel um, for the global summary. So <clears throat> when what we did actually uh, following the, the reconstruction of so many countries done in, in collaboration with uh, hundreds of colleagues throughout the world is, uh, was not rocket science. We just added up everything together. We, we just added it up. And uh, the result was published in, uh, in January uh, of this year in, uh, in uh, Nature Communication. And the, the secret um, of what we found... Daniel's hello? gotten very faint. Okay. Uh, and uh, what we found is uh, is in the title. We found that uh, m much more is being caught than is being reported by FAO, but that it is declining. And I will I will elaborate on both of these things. So uh, you, the difference uh, by FAO area. Uh, this is this large statistical area that FAO uses to uh, to present uh, uh, catches by 
by, by area, uh, uh, is summarized here. And you can see, for example, in the upper left, uh, the Arctic, uh, in red, uh, what is reported by, uh, in this case, by Russia, and uh, what is uh, caught as estimated by us. And for each area of the world, you can see a major discrepancy, uh, except in the Antarctic, where uh, a regional fisheries organization called CAMELA does a reasonable job of monitoring the fisheries, uh, including the discards. So uh, CAMELA uh, actually reports to FAO uh, reasonable data. Uh, uh, the difference is mainly uh, illegal catches that Kamala cannot uh, assess uh, and we do. Uh, uh, note also on the, on the right uh, uh, a number of, um, of um, <clears throat> especially the Western Central Pacific and the Eastern Indian Ocean, uh, two areas where the catch is, is increasing uh, uh, exponentially. Uh, especially in the Eastern Indian Ocean. And these are countries like Burma and Vietnam and, um, and uh, uh, for the Western Central Pacific, Indonesia and uh, Philippines, which report um, uh, ever-increasing catches, uh, even though there is really no basis for it, and uh, uh, fantasy uh, data. Uh, and we have corrected for this effect but, but uh, we have uh, not been able to correct all the bias that is induced. This is the only region of the world you can see where the nominal catch, the, the reported catch, still increased madly. Uh, in all the regions of the world, it, the reported catch declines and uh, the reconstructed catch also does. Uh, next. <coughs> and the second, the, the, this picture, this figure, is the, the most important. You can see that uh, <clears throat> uh, the reported catch, the actual catch, is about 50% above the reported catch. This, is, this means this is a positive thing, in a sense, because that means the oceans are far more productive than we thought. Fisheries of the world are far more productive than we thought. And we benefit from the ocean far more than we thought. That's one thing. The other thing is that there is a marked decline in the, in the, in the, in the last 20 years, uh, which is in reality probably much more stronger because uh, the, we did not correct for, we didn't fully correct for these countries that overreport their catch uh, that I just mentioned. And, and this decline means it's due to um, overfishing. It's not due to uh, countries having some countries having uh, uh, low quota because of good management. Because if you if and we have done that, if you subtract from the, the global catch the countries the catch of countries that use quota for management in U.S., uh, some countries in northwestern Europe, and uh, some countries in Oceania. If you subtract this, you still get a decline of the magnitude that is indicated here. So. Basically, there is too much fishing, and the strategy that worked before, which is to uh, fish the hell out of every resource and then move on to the next resource, doesn't work anymore because there is no place that we can go. And <coughs> this uh, is argue, argues for rebuilding and more conservation, uh, more careful uh, management of the resource, rebuilding of the resource wherever uh, they have been uh, Overexploited, and we also, for the first time, present on a global basis the the sectoral composition of the catch. And you can see that the artisanal fisheries, um, uh, even though they produce uh, the, the the yield uh, a catch that is uh, smaller than industrial catch, uh, contribute substantially to uh, to uh, food security because the the fish that they catch never goes into reduction fisheries, into for production of fish meal, is never thrown overboard, and is consumed by local population in uh, the various countries, by rural population also. So it, it, it is fish 
that uh, goes right where, where it is most needed. Where, where, and it is also the the fish that is sustained. Whereas the the industrial fishing uh, reflects this over, this local overfishing and then moving on. And uh, the it is the industrial fishing that is now declining. Uh, we are in the process of uh, separating the industrial fishing into fish for human consumption and uh, for uh, reduction fisheries, uh, fish meal production. And we are also going to separate it into trawler catch and non-trawler catch uh, so that this big block of uh, industrial fishing will be, will be uh, uh, sliced in, in uh, various components. But uh, the first uh, division into small-scale fisheries and large-scale fisheries allows appreciating that the small-scale fisheries are not negligible. And <clears throat> we end up with, with a comparison. If you look at uh, annual landing for human consumption, we, we get that the, the small-scale fisheries uh, are about one-third to, uh, to two-fifths of the, uh, um, the large-scale catches. They, they, have, they generate almost no discounts, the small-scale fisheries. Um, and all the fish that they produce is uh, used for human consumption. And the fuel use uh, is much less. Uh, the fuel use per ton of fish uh, caught is essentially due to uh, adjacency. Small-scale fisheries don't go so far to catch the fish, and also because they use passive gear, where the fish do the moving, and they don't move a gear, for example, a troll, through the water. And <clears throat> the the jobs are much uh, uh, much more abundant in small scale fisheries, and they are much cheaper to create. So basically, if you if you look at uh, at large scale versus small scale fisheries, uh, you should actually promote small scale fisheries. Uh, and uh, and it's very regrettable that countries uh, still have policies that uh, subsidize large scale fisheries. That uh, we can show that to be the case. So in the future, we will <coughs> we we will make uh, well. We have made this data available. Uh, all of this, all of, everything that we have presented to you is available online, and we will make this database ever uh, more detailed, ever more available. Uh, we will also publish an atlas uh, of about 500 page that documents for each country, that documents the method that we have used, that we have now presented to you, and uh, also document for each country, for 273 uh, countries or, or part of country, the summarize the, the, the trend, the catch trends. We have just sent it today, we have just sent back the proof to our publisher. We will update this series, and uh, hopefully we will uh, get uh, funding uh, in the future that allows us to maintain the data set and to update it. And we will, we will gradually expand the coverage uh, to include not only catches, but also the effort that is used to catch these things uh, using, um, using kilowatt uh, as a unit because uh, uh, of, of effort, uh, meaning, uh, meaning the power of the engine that are deployed to catch because this, uh, this will allow us to compare small boats with large boats and also because it allows us to deal with the fuel uh, consumption and a greenhouse gas emission and so on. And we end up uh, with an acknowledgement, as, as we should, uh, as to Pew, uh, the Pew Child Trust has supported us for 15 years very generously uh, and has allowed has allowed us to uh, to make the make uh, to conduct these studies. Uh, recently, the Paul Allen Foundation Family Foundation has helped us uh, to uh, to turn this data into a website uh, that is uh, the, just mind-bogglingly good. And the, these pictures uh, illustrate some people who work for us far more uh, have worked for us. Uh, actually, it's hundreds and um, 
uh, to these, uh, we must add the, the large number of people, of, of partners that we have in, in all the countries of the world that have made this possible. I think this is all. Yep, now we're open to questions. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Daniel and Dirk. Um, so I wanted to reiterate how to ask questions to everyone. Um, if you want to ask a question directly, um, you can raise your virtual hand and on mute you. And you can also type in questions in the question panel of the user interface. Um, so I have, I had uh, one question I wanted to ask. Have any um, fisheries management organizations at an international, national, or, or state, local level, have they, have they seen these reconstructions um, and are thinking and are actively thinking about changing their reporting practices? Uh, yes, they have. We've been trying wherever possible or wherever there's interest uh, to engage in, in local meetings, local workshops and present them to that. Um, I've already alluded to the Bahamas where this was presented uh, to government officials and to the government. <clears throat> and they are extremely interested in incorporating that and improving the data collection system. We also have quite a lot of success in West Africa, which are countries that are extremely uh, interested and have huge problems, resource problems, uh, financial problems, uh, technical problems, getting access to data. And they find this information extremely valuable, particularly in that case for West Africa, um, with regards to the, the large foreign industrial fleets that access their east at borders um, and yet seem to provide relatively little actual information to the countries uh, on their activities. Um, it also uh, is having impact in Somalia, where a partner group uh, that, that works with us has actually taken it to the Somali government, who has just now, the federal government of Somalia, was just now restarted a Department of Fisheries, which of course, as you know, with all the civil strife and the unrest and the piracy and so on, had no functional government. And they're trying to reestablish a functional government. And they have received our report and our data, and they're, and they're very interested in using this. Uh, they, it, this is the second country that uh, we built, um, Timor-Leste uh, in Southeast Asia also <clears throat> use our reconstruction as basis for uh, their planning because they, they have nothing left after the Indonesian uh, left. We, uh, they, the reception is very variable. Uh, in many countries, the reception is via the government and they like it very much. In other countries, the reception of our data is, is through groups that challenge the government. Right now, in New Zealand, there is a big storm brewing, uh, a big storm is not only brewing, it's exploding uh, in the press uh, in New Zealand about our reconstruction because the reconstruction that was done by our colleagues in New Zealand mainly uh, uh, illustrate documents a huge amount of, uh, of discarding, discar of discarding of the, of the species that were targeted. This is known as high grading and the, the quota essentially say you have a quota of 10,000 tons for fish A, and you catch these 10,000 tons several times because you want to improve the quality of what you have in, in, your, in your boat. And this discarding of a quota fish is actually totally illegal in this scandal. And, and right now, uh, the, the, there is a huge debate about, about, this, uh, uh, about our report in New Zealand, and uh, the, the, the debate is about, uh, among other things, how can so much discarding have gone on, uh, given that we have an observer program? And it, it is interesting that uh, in the same time, uh, uh, in various local newspapers in New Zealand, they have reported fish stranded, uh, stranding of fish, uh, dead fish in, uh, in uh, various beaches that are in line with, uh, with these discarding practices. So basically, the, the, there is a public debate right now about the, the veracity of what the government says. OK, well, I'm glad you guys uh, brought that up, because that we had actually someone had sent in a question asking about New Zealand specifically. Um, 
so we've had a number of questions come in. Um, another one that, that's come in, uh, what kind of small-scale fisheries access arrangements do you think would be most effective? Uh, and you, do, do you mean uh, access, uh, uh, exclusive access ar arrangement for uh, small-scale fisheries? I think uh, probably that's what they're going for. But because, uh, Tom, if you want to clarify. We don't have small-scale fisheries. We don't have them fishing in other countries. If, uh, if you mean act that they have exclude, that they should have access ag agreements or arrangements in, uh, in the countries where they operate, I think this is an excellent idea. Uh, because small-scale fisheries can catch more uh, than, they, than they do at present if the trawlers that are fishing inshore and competing with them can be, can be uh, get gotten out of the fishing zones of the inter, in, the, in the coastal waters. And, and I think that it is one of the best reforms that one can do or that one, one of the best laws that, one, that is on the book that one can implement, which is that they should be reserved for artisanal fisheries that they that uh, are not uh, exploited by uh, by trawlers and other industrial gear. This is uh, outstanding. This is a good policy everywhere. And I wonder if the questioner uh, was also asking, do you have any thoughts on what specific type of exclusive access arrangements work best? Uh, <clears throat> I think that the the, the access uh, this uh, private, uh, sorry, this exclusive access should be community-based and not individual-based. Because uh, if they are individual-based properties, they can be sold and they can get out of the community. Uh, uh, that is an experience that we see uh, in many countries. And basically, very good experience has been documented in Chile uh, of exclusive access to coastal resources. And in Chile, they have also managed to get the trawlers uh, and other industrial gear out of the uh, coastal band of 25 miles, I think. And, and this has uh, massively reduced the conflict and increased the, 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 the benefits to small-scale fishers. <clears throat> this can only go hand in hand. You cannot just empower small-scale fishers without doing something about the large-scale fisheries. Um, a, a prime example of that is several countries in West Africa officially have exclusive inshore areas that are only supposedly open to small-scale fisheries. And it might be, I think, 20 kilometers or something like that. But these are being violated repeatedly by the large number of industrial vessels that simply violate these, these areas and go in there and fish, big trawlers going right inshore. Um, so it, it would require going hand-in-hand -hand with monitoring and enforcement for large-scale fisheries. And one aspect that uh, was also indicated in, in one of the last slides to handle that is we need to get a handle on, on the subsidies that the countries pay to their fishing fleets because the overwhelming majority of these financial subsidies actually go to the industrial fleet. Think about fuel subsidies, building subsidies, uh, new engine subsidies, and so on. Um, if you could curtail those or redirect some of these subsidies to appropriate positive management actions for small-scale fisheries, um, you would actually curtail the existence of large-scale industrial fleets, many of which can only operate profitably because taxpayers are subsidizing them. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask another question. Um, uh, is the amount of subsidies given to industrial fishing fleets worldwide, is it on the increase or the, or the decrease? Uh, we have estimated, <clears throat> we have repeatedly estimated it uh, since uh, 2006. Uh, it is stable. We we do not detect a trend. Um, they estimate uh, if you do, if you if you use uh, uh, if you use uh, 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 dollars adjusted for inflation, this is about uh, uh, 30 billion a year, and it has not changed over the last 10 years that we studied this. Okay, well, okay, uh, thank you. That's a little disappointing that it's not decreasing, but at least it's not going up. Um, there was another question that came out. Uh, would you comment on the differences in the species caught by industrial, artisanal subsistence, and recreational sectors? Oh, 
Well, my, my first remark is that, <coughs> that in the tropics, especially in tropical zones, um, the, <coughs> the, the, the species are very much the same. If you, if you look at uh, trawlers and artisanal fishers, they are competing for the same resource or different life stages of the same resource. Uh, it is uh, with a tuna fleet that you find a, a radically different species composition. But uh, when you talk uh, about coastal fisheries, um, basically small scale fishers and large scale fishers fish the same thing. Uh, with regard to, uh, to, to recreational fisheries, uh, they tend to, to catch bigger fish uh, as a whole, except in, in some fisheries that have been documented in, in uh, Brazil that where the, they also catch small fish. But generally, in West Africa, for example, the, 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 sport, the recreational fishery, which exists, which has been documented, uh, catch bigger fish. Um, So-called game fish, they go for billfish or, or fish that they call fighting fish that uh, give them a good fight on, on, the, on the lure. Um, but yeah, they largely, largely go for, the, for, for very specific ones. So recreational might be targeting a, a very narrow subset uh, compared to yeah. the commercial fishery. But if you look at artisanal fisheries, commercial small-scale fisheries, and troll fisheries, uh, uh, they because they they operate very often inshore, they very much have the same catch, and the same thing is also true uh, for <clears throat> industrial fisheries in Europe or in North America, because the artisanal vessels are relatively big and they catch the same thing. And they, there is only a, a few exceptional fisheries um, beyond obviously the tuna fisheries. That are radically uh, that that catch fish that are not do not occur inshore. For example, the the Alaska pollock fishery. Uh, it is a monster, a big fishery uh, that is conducted in, industrially. I, it cannot be replaced by by an artisanal fishery. I, but it's one of the it's one it's a rare instance. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, there's another question that came in. For recreational fisheries, how do you account for releases in your data? Um, we, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, for the U.S., uh, the, 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 the release uh, fish, uh, the proportion of release fish that are deemed to have survived was considered, and these were, these were not uh, counted. Uh, for all other countries, we assume that uh, a fish that is caught is dead because uh, mostly they, <coughs> they do die. In, um, in all cases where when our review suggests that in a country there's a recreational fishery but it is deemed catch and release, then we did not estimate it at all. So if we had no detailed information like we had for the US, we rather conservatively said, okay, if this is a fishery, let's say for, for marlin, um, and it is deemed to be a legally required catch and release, we assume it is uh, all released and they all survive, so we did not estimate it. Therefore, our estimates of recreational catches, the mortality associated with it is most likely an underestimate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to ask a question if the models um, where we saw that the ocean, let's see, the oceans were more productive. I'm, all right, I'm going to need to parse out this question a little bit better. I'll read another one. Um, what ex explanation do you suggest for the increasing catch trends in the eastern Indian Ocean and western Pacific, western it's Central Pacific? It's an artifact of politics. Uh, the, there is intense pressure um, to generate uh, catch data that are positive, uh, that are that increase. Uh, if you look at a country like Burma, uh, the increase is almost a perfect, uh, a perfect exponential curve. That is, uh, if you take logs, uh, they, they become straight. That is, they add a certain percentage every year. Uh, in Indonesia, we, we calculated uh, how much is being added every year, and it's 2.5%. So, uh, 
So uh, you you get uh, each province has uh, has an increasing catch and in the increasing by two percent. 2.5 percent per year, and and uh, this is uh, the, uh, if you take logs, you will have a series of parallel lines that uh, that represent the, the catch uh, the catch over decades, and uh, these are clearly manufactured data. This is a, a clear fit features of manufactured data, and <clears throat> manufactured data are are clearly in Burma, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, <coughs> in Vietnam. And a few other countries, and China, obviously. Okay, thank you. Um, so the question that, uh, from before is, when you see with from the models that the uh, in, at the times that the ocean was um, more productive, uh, is it possible that the, any increases in productivity were due to marine stock enhancement efforts that some countries like Japan and U.S. have been doing? No, no basically. Basically, the the conclusion that uh, the ocean is more productive is based on the fact that uh, it it, produ it the catch uh, was 50 percent more than uh, uh, overall, approx approximately 50 percent more than reported. It it is not a productivity enhancement. It is just the documentation uh, of of the of what was caught that was deficient. It's not. It's not that somebody has has generated uh, 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 productivity, uh, in enhanced the productivity of of the ocean. It's simply that we underestimated it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we have two more. Uh, I think quick questions. So we'll we'll go to those and and then end. But if anyone did want to send in additional questions, um, I will re relay those to Dirk and Daniel as well. Um, yeah, sure. So one question: Did the data include catches taken for the ornamental aquarium trade? Uh, no, no, it does not. Um, <clears throat> that now, in some areas, in some countries, these catches are very large in terms of number of fish. But since in most cases these are juveniles and very very small, in, in terms of tonnage, they're actually very low, and we did not estimate those. No. They are. They would be minuscule. You, they they would totally uh, disappear in the background. In terms of tonnage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is also true for the live uh, for the live fish trade. Live free fish trade. That is extremely profitable. The fish yield incredible sums, but in tonnage, this is also a small amount. However, that is included in terms of tonnage. Uh, because it's part of an artisanal fishery. Um, in this case, the fish are kept alive for sale to, to restaurants rather than filleted. So it is included in our estimate of tonnage. Okay, thank you guys. And the last question um, I think is probably near and dear to your hearts. Uh, what is the best source of information on fishery subsidies for the Pacific Coast of Canada? Well, we can look at, uh, we can look at it. Uh, uh, in uh, in our website, uh, the, there is uh, the Seawanders website. Uh, there is for each country the an estimate of the of the subsidies, and uh, the the this uh, yeah, and um, and the the subsidies are listed together with the sources. So Dirk is looking. Uh, can you see me looking on the screen? Yes, we can. Yep. We're, we can follow along. He's, he's looking at... There's Fisher subsidies. Yep. Yeah. So, Eastern Canada, the sources are FAO, OECD, OECD, OECD. So, it's an APEC. So, there are, are the subsidies for both the, the early 2000s and late 2000s um, in thousands of, of dollar, US dollars. Yeah. Um, you see it here. These are the beneficial, these are what are deemed harmful, these are what are deemed ambiguous. And the grant, uh, sorry, ambiguous. And the grant total is here, so that's uh, okay. 1 billion in 2009 and 860 uh, uh, million in sorry, the early. Sorry, I, uh, that's 1 yeah, billion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm actually. Yes, 
Yeah, I'm glad you took us to the website um, to let, uh, give people a flavor for uh, all the information and the analytics that are available there. So uh, hopefully everyone will check that out. Yeah, um, um, and while, while we're here, th this is what I presented initially uh, and showed you. So that's the, the uh, dichotomy of our website where you can uh, obtain data, um, catch data and catch time series by various different parameters. And you can download all of these data um, in each case. Sorry, this is a big database. That's why it loads a little bit slowly. So you can actually download this data with all its parameters, um, or you can go to the other part of it, which is you can map the catch. So in this case, this is the globally mapped catch for 2010, and you can actually have the whole time series. So back from 1950, the global distribution, the spatial distribution of the global catch, uh, which you see is, is highly concentrated in coastal waters, and then you actually notice over the decades, the spatial expansion and the intensification of global catch as you go over time. You can choose fishing can countries, and earlier I mentioned Spain. So you simply select, you want to see Spain, and you get the spatial distribution of the catch of Spain. 2010, again, you can do this over time. And you notice particularly with the Spanish fleet, initially starting being restricted to the Atlantic, uh, underwent a global expansion very rapidly, especially in the 80s, 90s, and in the 2000s. So you have various options. You can also look for catches by taxon, by species, rather than by fishing kind of fleet. Um, so you have a wide variety of, of various tools here as well. It's not just about catch. Uh, it provides a large variety of different data uh, and also analytical tools uh, using the catch data. Okay, thank you, Dirk. Um, and so we'll conclude now, but Dirk and Daniel, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, I learned a ton, and um, I hope all of our uh, listeners will also check out the See Around Us website and, and, and incorporate this information into their work. Um, and, and thank you very much for presenting, and uh, hopefully we can have you guys on again uh, before too long um, to talk and, about and any research. questions they, uh, people can simply email us via our website there's a feedback uh, link and they can send us questions and they will get answered it might take a little while a few days or so before we can get back to everyone but we always welcome uh, comments and feedback okay thank you guys so much thank All right, you very much okay and thank you to everyone who's able to attend have a great uh, evening morning uh, depending on where you are okay bye everyone Okay, bye.